Super Talk Mississippi. From the Foundation Studio right here on Biloxi's Back Bay, I want to welcome you to Super Talk Outdoors where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime. The amazing world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi because as I say every week, we are the capital of the outdoors in America right here in Mississippi. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi Radio Network or on Super Talk TV at Seafire TV. Some of you might be watching on YouTube or Facebook or listening on your favorite podcast. It is June the 19th, 2023. Um, I especially want to thank the foundation, the, the title sponsor for Super Talk Outdoors. They're doing so much great work protecting Mississippi's outdoors heritage. And uh, in the second half of the shows I've done each week, we're going to remind you of this whole awesome raffle that's underway right now at the foundation. We'll tell you how you can get your tickets. By the way, uh, the views on this show are mine and uh, not those of the foundation. As I, as I like to say, when it comes to outdoors issues or issues that are important to outdoorsmen and women, you can count on me to say what needs to be said when it comes to conservation and outdoor enjoyment in, in uh, the state of Mississippi. And I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to be in a position where I can be independent and say what needs to be said. Uh, hey, I want you to know I really enjoyed uh, Father's Day weekend. I know the producer of the show, Kyle Curley, did as well. He did some uh, coastal fishing with his son. A lot of people went out in the outdoors. It's, you know, listen, to be honest with you, the weather has been not so good. So uh, I happen to live in like the only place it seems to me that it wasn't storming. Uh, you know, to the left of me was storming, to the right of me, and certainly north of uh, Biloxi was storming. We got a few uh, 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 rain drops, but uh, lots of lightning and bad thunderstorms around us. But the tradition at our house is to do a crab ball. So a few days ahead of Father's Day, we put out the crab traps. The salinity and everything is perfect in Back Bay right now. The crabs are absolutely gigantic. They're huge and uh, they're full of meat. So um, we had a great time. I, I've really perfected the the uh, the the recipe. Uh, I have I have my friend Mark Creech, who I've talked about on the show many times. He, I, ca I call him a guyver because he can li literally do anything. He gave me a terrific recipe a few years ago, and I combined that a little bit with my wife's mother's recipe. Um, uh, Anne's parents, one was Yugoslavian, came from, his parents came from Croatia, and her mother is uh, is uh, Cajun French. And uh, her father talked like this when he talked. He, he would love to eat some crabs. Yeah, but but, but uh, yeah, I did a little com combination of the recipes over the years and really got it down to a science. It's full of celery and mushrooms and corn and potatoes and garlic and onions and a mix of various crab bowl products. Slap your mama salt, a lot of salt, probably too much salt, that's for sure. But it's so good. And uh, I posted... Uh, or we posted a video with, uh, of the process at the Super Talk Outdoors Facebook page if you want to see more about that. And by the way, my, my two, grand, two of my grandkids and I, Riley and Brody, were out checking the crab traps. And uh, two uh, Marine patrolmen, Michael Fitz and Jack Husley, I mentioned to them that I would, I'd shout, give them a shout out. Um, we thanked them for uh, to coming over and visiting with us and making sure that we were safe. And, um, you know, we, uh, we had a wonderful conversation with, with Michael and Jack. They, 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 rec they represent the kind of people that, that I want to celebrate on the show as often as we can. The people, Marine Patrol and Wildlife Fisheries and Parks officers that are out there working every day to keep us safe. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. But I mentioned to, to Michael and to uh, Jack that the work th that I was doing at that moment with my uh, grandkids, Riley and Brody, checking crab traps, there's no other place I'd want to be in the world than in that moment with those grandkids. And it was great to, uh, it was great to, uh, to create a great memory. And it's also good to, to meet Michael and Jack. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Okay, so now let's shift gears and move over to my friend Ricky uh, Flynn, who's the project manager for the Mississippi Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund. We're going to get the latest on that. They just announced some big projects that are it's just awesome to, to see that this first year has gotten out, out of the gate uh, so strong. But anyway, Ricky, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Doing great. Uh, we talked a little bit before the uh, before the show started, but man, this is some weird weather, isn't it, buddy? It's extremely odd. It's, you, you wouldn't know that it was June by looking at the weather. It feels more like April. 
Yeah, here it's been, uh, in fact, I noticed that on the, uh, for one of the, I think it might have been Good Morning America, had Biloxi listed as one of the hot places in America with a, with a heat index of uh, 109 plus. On a day when you're expecting severe thunderstorms and all these other things, you walk outside and you can literally cut the air right now, Ricky. It's just incredible. The humidity has been tremendous and then just the sky, the radar looks clear. looks like you've got a good afternoon ahead of you. And within an hour, you've got some really intense, severe thunderstorms just all over the place tracking down on you. It's, it's been crazy here in central Mississippi. Hey, listen, uh, so it's fun staying in touch with you. First of all, while you were at the department, you became quite famous with your efforts with the alligator program. In fact, I had a, we haven't seen the uh, quote unquote nuisance alligator that we had here around my house in a, in, uh, a week or so, which is a good thing. Um, but we had a, you know, eight to 10 foot alligator hanging out around my house. I posted a video. I looked this morning, it's been viewed thousands of times. So people are infatuated with alligators, aren't they, Ricky? No doubt. Um, the last decade and a half, uh, alligators have gotten a tremendous amount of uh, airtime. Cable television and uh, news media outlets uh, are really spending a lot of time talking about alligators. Well, look, you love the outdoors, too, and we've talked about your love of the outdoors, and I saw from your social media posting that you did a trip down the uh, at coast of Alabama or yeah. Florida recently, uh, and Orange Beach, Gulf Shore, Perdido Beach area. Yeah, I love. You know, I was publisher of the of the, of the uh, press register in Mobile, and we spent a lot of time down in that part of the country. And in fact, uh, I had the opportunity to lead the oil recovery planning efforts for Governor Riley. We had over a thousand people involved in that, and the mayors of Orange Beach and Gulf Shores became very good friends of mine. I get, obviously because of that, we spent a lot of time. Twenty five percent of the state's total Total tourism of the state of Alabama, 25% of the total tourism for the whole state happens in Baldwin County in three months. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, that tells you how important that area is to the rest of the state of Mrs. Uh, state of Alabama, just like the coast is important to the rest of the state of uh, Mississippi. But I saw you caught a pompano and, you know, yeah. you take an outdoorsman and you transplant somewhere, we're going to find a way to enjoy being out, <laughs> outside, aren't we? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed contributing to uh, Alabama's uh, revenue uh, during that time. I've, I, I've, I've learned to enjoy the beach. I'm not particularly fond of going out there and laying in the sun and sweating all afternoon, but I've learned to find some other activities while the wife and the girls are out doing that. But I, I surf fish a little bit. I enjoy going after the ladyfish, uh, which are a tremendous amount of fun. And, and then I decided to... Uh, really wanted to try and target Pompano. I've got a friend that uh, has been fairly successful at it, took some tips from him and got prepared. And I was just tickled to uh, catch a few uh, over some bad weather days again. But uh, boy, I tell you what, I found out what I've been missing. That is the absolute best fish I've ever put in my mouth. You put that yeah, thing Pompano, on a grill, great, great. Great eating, great eating. You know, we, we have, you know, of course, you know, it's interesting because if you go down Cat Island, Ship Island, Horn Island, Petty Boys Island, then Dolphin Island, and then and you get on over to the Orange Beach area. In fact, when we, when I, we, we will do a little family vacation in Orange Beach every now and then. I can leave the house in the boat and I'll beat Ann to Orange Beach when she's driving there by car. But, um, but anyway, the, the the very islands of coastal Mississippi, Horn Island and and uh, Ship Island are great places to target Pompano, and uh, man, some terrific catches happen there as well. That's for sure. Hey, listen, uh, the Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund that we all worked so hard for over a two-year period, the legislature got on the same page about it. The governor signed it into law. They they put together a terrific board of trustees. They hired you from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks to, to manage the project. Um, it was off, off and running with a fir great first year. Lots and lots of applications, a lot of, uh, lot of matching funds. We, we were really focused on matching funds that you could turn a dollar into a single dollar into two or three or four dollars. But you just recently announced uh, 21 projects, and uh, it's exciting to have taken this first step, isn't it? It is. Um... You know, when I first uh, started in this position in February, uh, I couldn't hardly envision getting to the place where we are right now. There's been a lot of work done. Our board has worked 
tremendously hard and uh, thank goodness for our coalition partners uh, leading the way uh, and, and setting the foundation uh, for where we are. And, um, you know, with not a tremendous amount of effort, uh, the word got out uh, and we had a tremendous response from uh, agencies, municipalities, organizations across the state for applications. And uh, the response was great, 104 applications received and uh, it was good to see that response. It was awesome to see that response. And then that meant after that, that the uh, Board of Trustees had their work cut out for them. When we come back, we'll remind you what the Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund is, a little bit more about the Board of Trustees. And then we'll give you an idea of uh, what are some of the, what are good demonstration projects that, could, that are going to come out of that 21, uh, that 21 projects that were approved. We'll see you. These outdoors. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I have my friend Ricky Flynn who has been on this show many, many times in his former capacity as head of the alligator program for the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks. And more recently in the most recent iteration of his career, contributing his years of experience to the Mississippi Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund, which uh, as I mentioned before, we went to break, just approved 21 projects statewide, $9.8 million. And uh, we'll get to specifically what some of those projects were here in just a second. But let's remind people, when you're talking to people about what the Mississippi Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund is, uh, how do you talk about it? Well, um, you know, obviously we have some great conservation agencies in the state of Mississippi, Mississippi Wildlife Fishers and Parks and Department of Marine Resources. Uh, and then you've got a number of non-government organizations doing great things to uh, promote wildlife conservation, fisheries conservation. But um, this Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund was designed to be a source of funding for not only state agencies and uh, state parks, but municipalities uh, and community parks, uh, non-government organizations, uh, counties, you name it, uh, that have interest in promoting uh, projects in their areas that uh, are more geared towards conserving wildlife, conserving fish, uh, working with uh, habitats, um, get making park improvements and promoting outdoor recreation and um, i think those are the priority things that are listed in the bill uh, and it's a great source of funding that these entities can make application for uh, hopefully they are able to secure matching funds that helps us as the state is providing money to uh, fund these projects that it brings in additional funds, either local, state, and particularly federal funding uh, to increase the amount of funding uh, going to these projects, which improves our, our economy. Um, it improves uh, more opportunities for jobs, uh, you name it. And this is a multi-billion dollar uh, business in wildlife and fish conservation and highly supported by Mississippi voters. Uh, this bill, uh, as it was written, was uh, supported by over 75% of Mississippi voters, and that is unheard of uh, as far as most legislation to have that much support. Yeah, it is, uh, it is a, it's a big deal. And for folks who, who did not capture the, the, the last conversations that we had over the last two years about this, the reality is that we were one of two states in the Southeast that did not have a program like this. And when you have places like Georgia that are able to leverage 20 million into nearly 100 million, they really get your attention. And when they've been making year after year after year investments in outdoor enjoy enjoyment, and Mississippi was sort of uh, not on in the game because we didn't have a fund that enabled us to do the matching. In this particular case, the, the legislature for the first year put 10 million aside, 9.8 million was uh, distributed to 21 projects. And, uh, and, and that was matched by more than $31 million. So, I mean, anytime you can do an investment like that and get an, a, get a return on your investment like that, 
and get projects that are going to really, really enhance Mississippians' ability to enjoy the outdoors, it's a big win. And, uh, you know, the legislature, this just this past legislative session, uh, allocated $15 million for this coming year. So hopefully eventually, Ricky, as you and I have discussed before, we can get away from the annual allocation and go to some kind of dedicated funding source so we don't have to go back to the legislature every year. But I, I think what, I, what I've been told is uh, legislators are, are open to the conversation. I, I think they just needed to see... You know, what does it look like? What kind of projects are going to come out of this? What what kind of work will the board of trustees do that will be so compelling to say, we, we you know, let's don't let's don't put us through this every year trying to find out how much the money is going to be. Let's do, let's go with some kind of dedicated funding source. Okay, so Ricky, let's uh let's go to the projects themselves, and why don't you just kind of hum a few bars of uh, examples of projects that were that were uh, approved? Yeah, so. Um... Like you mentioned, $9.8 million worth of funding, uh, which also has a over a $31 million matching fund source tied to those projects. There's 21 projects that we funded. Uh, we had 104 applications. Unfortunately, there's limited funding. Uh, there was a lot more great projects that we would love to fund. Uh, that Just because they didn't get funded didn't mean we didn't have more great projects, which is great information for our future uh, as we go forward. But um, one of the biggest projects is uh, one titled the Pearl River Source Water Protection and Water uh, Recreation Project Phase 1, uh, which is a $2.6 million project located right here in the Jackson metropolitan area. It's, a lot of people may recognize the, <laughs> the Fannie Cook Nature Preserve, which is located between Ross Barnett Reservoir and Lakeland Drive here near Floyd, Mississippi. Uh, this is going to provide uh, enhancements uh, and per perpetual easements for that property uh, to save it in perpetuity, and that is very important. Um, it's a very unique area. Lots of plans for enhancements uh, of possible uh, boat ramp access to some new water on some public waterways. Um, just a tremendous amount of so much that I can't even try to describe it all. Uh, well, Rick, Rick, you know what? <clears throat> this particular project, when I read about it, it was uh, I think it's a great example of uh, of the dilemma the trustees have. And that is you have a lot of projects and you could you could you could take the point of view. OK, we're going to spread out the 9.8 million to as many projects as we can. So you end up funding a lot of smaller projects. Or you can pour your money, you can put some big money into the big projects like the Pearl River Source Water Protection and Recreation Project, Phase 1, and say, hey, we're gonna, we, we want to fund these big efforts like this because when we start talking about purchasing right away and these kinds of things that will enhance our ability to, to have more outdoor enjoyment and, and uh, at recreational areas like that, it takes big money to accomplish that. So I bet this is a big discussion the trustees had. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, after the board ranked uh, or scored all the projects, I ranked them for them and gave them a list of how these projects all ranked out. Going down the list, uh, you know, looking at the funds, at, at some point as you start uh, approving each of these projects, the money runs out. And uh, fortunately, one thing that was able to happen as we got down towards the end, um, we were able to fund uh, a, a larger sum of smaller projects uh, that uh, still contribute great great opportunities for people. Uh, you've got this $2.6 million project. We also have several projects that are in the $8,700, $10,000 project range that are still going to be very uh, beneficial to those types of people in those areas. So, um, you know, being able to get 21 projects, I was very pleased with that. Uh, there was a time that I thought we'd be lucky to get more than 13. Uh, but as it works out, 21 is a, is a great number. Um, one of the other great projects uh, that a lot of our viewers may be familiar with is uh, some waterfowl enhancements over at Howard Miller and Mahana WMAs uh, in the South Delta. Uh, it's titled the Mississippi Delta Wetlands Enhancement, Enhancement Project, and this will be uh, managed through Ducks Unlimited. Uh, this money is being funded through them. Uh, 4,200 acres of public lands, 
Uh, this project's going to renovate existing waterfowl impoundments, levees, replace some water control structures, improve drainage, convert water well structures, and provide some gravel road and levee access. Uh, it's a million dollars worth of funding. Uh, and people who use that area may know that it's great uh, and it's probably some of the best public waterfowl hunting opportunities anywhere in the southeast. But, uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, some of the infrastructure uh, degrades and needs some help. And, and this is going to provide some great enhancements to that to those areas. Yeah, you know, it's great to see Ducks Unlimited as a partner on this. Ducks Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy and Wildlife Mississippi and the Foundation and, and many others that are part of this coalition that you mentioned. You know, they've got, they've got the ability to go look and see what's happening in other states. Uh, they can help Mississippi speed up our ability to affect as many positive investments as we possibly can as quickly as possible. And so they bring a lot of best practices to the table. But Ed Penny has been a great partner. And it's, it's awesome to see a, a, a relationship with, with Ducks Unlimited on public land, on public land, something like in the South Delta. That's a, that's a classic positive project, isn't it, buddy? It is. Um, they, they, they've done a great job on uh, the projects that we've worked with them before in the uh, Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Uh, they are great at this business and securing good uh, contractors to do the work. Hey, why don't we do this? Uh, Ricky, join me for just a little bit during the next seg segment. Then we're going to be joined during the next segment with Ryan Jones, and we're going to talk more about the latest in his world. I have some more questions about what private property owners need to do to get their advice uh, on their ponds and whatever. I got one specific uh, and a friend of mine when I ask that question. But when we come back, we'll finish our conversation with Ricky Flynn, and we'll be joined by Ryan Jones. We'll see you after this. And uh, we'll be joined here shortly by Ryan Jones, and we'll talk about uh, the work that they're doing on private property, pond management, et cetera. So we'll see you after. We'll see uh, Ryan here shortly. So Ricky, coming back to the list, great mix of uh, of projects. Um, the Richardson Sportsplex, an outdoor recreation park, you know, another just really good uh, example. It is, and uh, you know, one of the goals of the of the fund was to uh, specifically uh, of, uh, provide additional access to uh, public lands, public waterways, and uh, Richardson helps with that. Uh, also, the there's a Sims Road uh, river access uh, project down in the Hasburg area uh, that's going to provide some new access uh, to the Leaf River and a 9.6 mile boating route there and uh, an existing park uh, access for canoers and uh, boaters um, on the on the uh, non-government organization end, we have a, a facility down in Kapai County that's called the Kamasa Lakeside Fish and Fellowship. Uh, we're going to be providing some specialized access for handicapped uh, children and adults uh, there. A great opportunity to provide outdoor recreation to a special group of people that probably need more opportunities for them and uh that's going to be a great one um, hey what's great about that ricky incidentally again so thinking about these non non-governmental partnerships like with the kamasa lake uh one that you just mentioned mm -hmm. uh the kelly Je kelly jane cook foundation is uh is the partner on that one you you mentioned uh, before that uh the work that's being done uh up here with the stewardship agreement from national forest uh, and to improve forest health uh, uh, and the uh, and the uh, partners of the U.S. Forest Service, Entergy, and the Nature Conservancy, you mean you just want to see those kind of collaborations. When you have those kind of collaborations, you really can't go wrong, can you? No. Um, yeah, we have uh, two of the projects that were uh, awarded funding in this are statewide projects. They are uh, affiliated with Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, uh, primarily state-owned. WMAs where we can really make a significant difference uh, in managing habitats and the types of activities that go on those state-owned areas. Uh, 
I know you've got Ryan Jones coming on here in a little bit. We've got a project that's going to be helping uh, fisheries restore Horseshoe Lake up in the Mississippi Delta near Chula. Uh, that's a that's an area that has been uh, plagued with water hyacinth, and it has just about completely shut down recreation to a, an important uh, Mississippi Delta fishery. And so this funding will help eradicate water hyacinth on that lake and get that uh, access restored back to the Mississippians. Um, we've got a great project up at Tishomingo State Park. Uh, the Friends of Tishomingo State Park, which is a nonprofit organization, uh, asked for $102,000 to help them restore uh, trails there on, on that uh, state park. Uh, I forget about, I think it's about 13 miles of nature trails. And all the work is gonna be done by volunteers. They just need the money to secure the, uh, the commodities to be able to get it done and they're gonna do all the work. Um, so Rick, let's do this so, and we'll go, we'll go to Ryan here shortly. What, what, what's, what's so amazing about looking at this list of initial projects and then the list of projects that were not approved that we, if we just had the money, we could just do more of this. It's just a wide range of projects, and you think about you know creating access for handicapped kids, more access to to the ability to enjoy the outdoors. If, if it involves, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, buying right away, it could be you know m making enhancements to a visitor center. You think about all the partnerships that are out there. When you start looking at the diversity of projects, the amount of money that we're putting out there, and the partners who are at the table, man. There's just, you know, as the word travels about these projects, now that we've got these demonstration projects out there, the the demand for the money is going to just go up big time, exponentially, don't you think? I do. We, we've we already received additional, uh, uh, you know, conversations with other entities that have yet to apply uh, that are interested in submitting applications in our next round that we hope to get going uh, by this fall. And you mentioned, uh, you know, securing uh, some good, secure funding for our projects in the in the future. Uh, I feel like uh, that our legislatures needed to see that this uh, program can work. Uh, they needed to see uh, the types of programs that we are attracting that can be funded. And I feel very good about that. That this is going to give a lot of assurance to our legislators that this is a good program that the funding is going to uh, good resources for the state of Mississippi and it's going to and then also seeing the the broadcast net of where these projects exist in Mississippi it's is from the uh, state line at Tennessee all the way down the Gulf Coast and and we're spreading spreading that money out uh, proportionately all across the state which is a good thing Walnut Mississippi where I killed my first turkey a few years ago with my friend who recently passed away, Al Hopkins, what an amazing man he was, but he loved Walnut, Mississippi. People in Walnut who are listening, you know Al Hopkins. He's uh, quite quite a, 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 an amazing man, and people there know him and respect him greatly. But right there, a beautiful area, incidentally. Yeah, absolutely beautiful area of the state of Mississippi. But listen, the uh, last thing I'll say is the Board of Trustees, I've watched the, uh, the majority of their meetings on YouTube, and man, one was one thing was clear from the moment they hit the ground running. They were in it to win it. They they put the time. These are guys who are incredibly successful entrepreneurs and business people. They certainly didn't do it for the money. They did it because they wanted to give back to the community. But at the end of the day, man, they they did not leave a stone unturned in their leadership of this project, did they? It's been great working with them uh, from day one. Uh, they always. Uh, have great questions. They're 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 inquisitive about things that they don't know about, uh, and they they seek good guidance for those. And and we've got a good source of coalition members to provide us additional guidance. And uh, being the fact that they are great businessmen uh, in their own uh, right um, helps me helps us. Uh, to do the right things, make good decisions, and uh, it's it's just been great working with them. Well, Ricky Flynn, it's been great to catch up with you. Uh, we'll uh, we'll have you back soon and continue the conversation, talk about more some more of these projects. So have a great day, and we'll move over to our, our friend uh, Ryan Jones now and, uh, and say good morning to Ryan. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Ricky. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Hey, listen, when you and I talked about 
the the work that you guys are doing at Horseshoe Lake uh, uh, th three or four weeks ago. I don't know that I realized that it was the stewardship fund that was going to be funding that that effort, and that's ex that's super exciting to uh, to hear. But it's an important project, isn't it? It is. Uh, you know, I mean, it's an excellent excellent fishery, and you know, when we pushed the ramp on it. In a 600 acre ox boat, it had about 400 acres of water highs and, and just the uh, nutrients uh, from ag land around it, you know, that water highs and population just kind of explodes, especially late in the year, uh, turns into what they call bull, bull highs. And so, uh, you know, it could be four, standing four feet off the surface, you know, huge, tall floating mats uh, and you can't get, push a boat through it and that sort of thing. So. Uh, it's a tall task, and like I said, we're we're um, using those funds to buy a containment boom, which kind of separates the uh, hyacinth into little zones, so that we can kind of systematically spray this area, move to this area, and then and then rotate back around and try to keep it from mixing around, which is what it does, makes it very difficult to treat. And we're going to be uh, contracting aerial applications as well as airboat applications uh, follow up, and then we'll also follow it up as well. So it's going to be a big, big project, and it's, and it's, um, you know, anytime you try to treat water highs, it, it can, it can be a, a challenge. You know, so. I, I, as you and I discussed before, there are there are so many unfortunate examples all across the state, particularly in the middle part of the state, where we've got a highest in challenge. And, uh, you know, it, it dies off, but it, it's, it, it reminds me of kudzu, man. It just comes back in, in waves, doesn't it? You really had to be mean to it, you know. Uh, <laughs> you have to because it, it's going to grow uh, very fast in the Delta. And, and you know, I, I, these outdoor stewardship trust fund opportunities, I'd like to just take it one lake at a time and really just start to try to move our way through the Delta as long as they'll, you know, help help us uh, with funding and that sort of thing. Do the best we can to open up all these fisheries that are just dynamite, you know, and providing – you know, a lot of sustenance fishing for uh, low-income families and that sort of stuff in those in those towns around those uh, those fisheries. Yeah, yeah, I have a, I have a friend that lives on the Yazoo, and who man, I mean, it goes from being beautiful in the winter time to you almost can't see water. There's so much uh, there's so much hyacin, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully this can this project can be successful using the booms and going after it, like you say, mean and <laughs> being mean to it, and uh, and then that that whatever you learn from that can be taken to the next one and the next one, and the next one. Hopefully, hopefully we can do that and, and build in a program inside the department to do that. It, uh, hope, it's ho hopeful that we'll be able to. Hey, why don't we do this? We'll, we'll continue our conversation with Ryan Jones when we get on the other side. We'll see you after this. Mississippi where a mockingbird sings out on his limb Whistling that sweet soul for him I said three We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. Uh, the presenting sponsor is the foundation. Uh, their formal name is the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Foundation. They are separate from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks and really help with uh, outdoors projects and um, other things that, you know, the fill gaps for the department, they do such a good job. They've got a, a raffle underway as we speak. You can go look it up. I think probably the best way to do it is just put in the, the Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks raffle, and you'll get plenty of information. But you could you could win a $50,000 Ford vehicle voucher, a Legends Hunt with Cuz Strickland and Preston Pittman, an Argentina dove hunt for eight hunters, a 10-day guided African safari, or an ultimate outdoors package full of all kinds of items. So tickets are only $20. You can get three for $50, 10 for $100, $25, tickets for $150. And you've got until the end of July to uh, to buy your ticket. I really encourage you to. You'll help, help outdoor enjoyment in the state, and you'll also have a chance to win some great prizes. So let's get back uh, to my friend uh, Ryan Jones. Ryan, let's remind people what you do. So I was a Central Region Fisheries Biologist uh, for 10 years, and um, and so now I'm, I'm at headquarters here. I'm coordinating 
the regional fishers biologists and hatchery managers statewide now. So, so, so I have a specific example. You and I talked about this uh, the last time we talked, but I have a friend of mine, Jake Carter, who's, I call him my outdoor son, incidentally. His dad is a really good friend, but they, he, his dad, Rick, doesn't hunt and fish. And so for most of Jake's life, he has hunted and fished with me. And uh, he's grown now and he's got his own kids. And I, I had the pleasure of hunting with his kids, just like they're my grandkids. And it's a, it's a great relationship. But he, uh, he, he FaceTimed my son Jordan and I over the weekend while Jordan and I were working on the crabs and getting ready to boil some crabs. And he was fishing at one of his ponds up in, they have a place up in Stone County. And, um, and he, you know, he, it was just, it's beautiful up there, but he has small bass, has too many, they're just too many bass. They haven't been managed properly and all that. And I mentioned your name to him. I said, yeah, I actually just had him on my show not realizing that you were going to be back on today. And I said, I, I, I need to, I'll, I'll introduce the two of you. And uh, I think the department's got some great advice for how you can tackle the problem that you've got here at, at your place. And he said, oh, man, that would be great. But, you know, people just aren't aware of this great service that you guys provide. But what we like if you were dealing with Jake, what, what's the first thing you're going to do when you when you go take a look at that at that lake? Yes, I'm always wanting to know I'm a, right off the bat, how big is it? You know, is it less than an acre? Is it over an acre? How many acres around about? Is it what, what was it stocked with? And if they can't provide a lot of those answers or whatever i typically just go into what are you catching you know um and if they haven't fished it yet well then i typically send them a measuring sheet to go ahead and try to do that <laughs> but oftentimes when people come back um and they say that they're they catch big brim and uh a lot of small bass that's that's what our our, our typical uh balance of of it's basically unbalanced it's, it's called bass crowded okay so you got a lot of small bass that eat up a lot of the small brim and results in uh, less competition for bigger brim, so they grow larger. So to correct it and get it more to a, a balanced scenario, you just want to harvest uh, small bass. You know, that's all it is. Uh, you know, harvesting uh, on average 10 to 10 to 15 pounds of bass per acre uh, annually, uh, you know, the uh, 14 inches and below, somewhere around in there, uh, 13 inches and below. Really depends on where your fish population is. Uh, but, you know, harvest is, is the key. Uh, because if you if you don't harvest any bass, it'll just naturally it just goes bass crowded. Uh, the bass just out reproduce uh, the brim. Yeah, I looked at a friend of mine. His name is Clay. You guys worked with him, and he he I, I think is it lime, but you you recommended that he like loaded loaded up with lime. What what's what's that for, and what's that going to do to help him? So a lot of a lot of soils are somewhat acidic, um, and and especially if you have large pine plantation in the watershed. Uh, the leaf litter from the pines as they decompose and, and rainwater washes through it can kind of push acidic uh, decomposition into the lake and, and, and make your soil acidic. And what that lime does is just neutralize its soil pH and brings it back uh, kind of into a neutral scenario. Uh, without teaching a chemistry course here, when your soils are acidic, they hold on to the nutrients down into the mud. So when you when you lime, it actually releases releases those nutrients back into the water column so that you can get a phytoplankton bloom, which is basically when you see a pond out there that's green, it's just billions and billions of microscopic little plants out there. When you grow a lot of that phytoplankton, you end up growing what's called zooplankton, which is microscopic little bugs, you know, flipping around in the water. And so every time, uh, brim spawn or bass spawn and those fish hatch out of the eggs and they're translucent little fry, you know, they're eating zooplankton. So when you have a lot of zooplankton out there, you grow a lot of fish. You have a lot, a lot more healthy spawns, successful spawns, uh, and, and you're able to, to grow more fish. And that's why people fertilize, you know, Right, right. That's, and, and by the way, in the case of Jake, they do have a bunch of pines nearby, and I never really, I never really understood that relationship. Anyway, hey, listen, it's great to catch catch up with you again, Ryan. Uh, have a great day, and we'll we'll see you soon. We'll stay in touch with you on a regular basis. Thanks, Rick. Enjoy. It's been Ryan Jones from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Have a great day, and as I always end every show, stay safe when you're in the outdoors. We'll see you next Monday. God bless you. Mississippi